And gazing skywards now on BBC One, Patrick Moore. Good evening. I always think that one of the loveliest stars in the sky is Vega in Lyra, the Lyra or Harp. It's very high up now, and it never actually sets over Britain, though on winter evenings it is very low down. It's the fifth brightest star in the sky, and it's decidedly blue, which shows that its surface is much hotter than the sun's. And um, even with the naked eye, it's a lovely sight. But it's not the only interesting thing in Lyra, not by a long way. For example, very close to it is Epsilon Lyrae. Look carefully, and you see that that star is made up of two, very close together. Binoculars separate them well, and if you use a telescope, you will see that each of those components is itself double. So we have a double-double or quadruple star. The other three stars there are in the foreground between Epsilon Lyrae and ourselves. Then also in Lyra, there is Beta Lyrae, or Shelayak. And that's made up of two stars so close together that they are practically touching. And obviously, we can't see them individually. But they're going around our common center of gravity, and when one gets in the way of the other, the total light varies. And so we have what's called an eclipsing binary. Near Beta is the third magnitude star, Gamma Lyrae. Nothing remarkable there. But directly in between Beta and Gamma, we have a most fascinating object, the planetary nebula M57, so-called because of the 57th object in a catalogue of star clusters and nebulae drawn up way back in 1781 by the French astronomer Charles Messier. I've never been able to see M57 with binoculars. Some people say you can, but a telescope shows it, and it looks like a tiny ring in the sky. It's known, in fact, as the Ring Nebula. Some time ago, when we were over at La Palma in the Canary Islands with the Isaac Newton telescope, they obtained, while we were there, the first colour video of any object beyond the solar system, and it happened to be of the Ring Nebula M57. And this is done by building up the image with various coloured filters, and you get a succession of these, and finally, you end up with the actual view of the Ring Nebula itself. And there again, you can see the central star, and also a second star, which is an interloper, in between the Ring and ourselves. It really is a marvellous sight. But it's called a planetary nebula, and it's not the only one by a long way. But that's not a good name, because it's nothing to do with the planet, and it's not truly a nebula. And at this stage, I'm delighted to introduce to the sky at night Dr. Chris Kitchen at the University of Hertfordshire. Welcome to the sky at night, Chris. Thank you, Patrick. First of all, if these things are not nebulae, and certainly aren't planets, then why are they called planetary nebulae? Well, like so much that appears odd at first sight in astronomy, the roots of it go way back in time into history. Uh, in this case, to a person whom I think of as one of the greatest observational astronomers of all time, William Herschel, uh, the first man in recorded history to discover a planet. Um, with the sort of uh, magnificent photographs we get from spacecraft, it's difficult sometimes to remember what a distant planet looks like in a small telescope. And uh, it's useful to note that Herschel, when he first saw the planet Uranus, which he was the discoverer of, actually thought it was a comet. How does it And uh, amongst his other activities, other than discovering planets, mm -hmm. he spent a lot of time looking at fuzzy objects not just comets and distant planets, um, but objects further away than that, uh, which we now call the nebulae. And uh, he drew many of these in great detail, and some of his drawings are easily recognizable today. And uh, he was convinced, to begin with, that these were distant star systems. And they appeared nebulous because the stars were too far away to be seen individually and just appeared as a blur. Um, as he built bigger and bigger telescopes, culminating in this 40-foot telescope, he found many of these fuzzy blobs did resolve into stars, but many did not. And he found one in particular in which there was a star superimposed upon a fuzz, a nebula, and he became convinced that these two objects were physically linked, so that the nebula in this case um, was not a distant star system, but was something else. Um, the name derives, therefore, from the fact that these objects are roughly circular, like a planet, faint like a planet, and of the same sort of angular size as a distant planet. 
but as you say, they bear no relationship whatsoever to planets. Um, Herschel looked at so many of these nebulae that he eventually drew up a catalogue, and the work was continued by his son John Herschel and by John Dreyer, and culminated in a catalogue known as the New General Catalogue of Nebulae, uh, which we still use today. Abbreviated to NGC, we use the number of the nebula in that catalogue as its name. So the nebula that Herschel first studied is one that we now call NGC 1514. Well, Herschel's work was continued by other astronomers and became a very important topic to try and find out what the real nature of these fuzzy blobs that weren't star systems um, could be. And in 1845, William Parsons, the Earl of Ross, spent the incredible sum of £12,000 of his own money to build a leviathan of a telescope, a 72-inch telescope, specifically to try and sort out the nature of these fuzzy blobs. Um, he didn't succeed. He did find that some of the nebulae had a spiral shape. And we now know that these, in fact, are distant star systems, and we call them galaxies. However, at that time, he didn't uh, see them as star systems. They remained as fuzzy blobs. And these, the spiral nebulae and the other fuzzy nebulae, remained mysterious. Then how is it shown, finally, that objects such as M57 were totally different in nature from the, the ordinary gaseous nebulae, such as M42 and the Sword of Orion? Well, the nebula part of a planetary nebula is not, in fact, all that different in its essentials. And the first clues to that in, uh, again date back um, and to a third William in the story, uh, William Huggins. He was one of the first astronomers um, to put a spectroscope on a telescope and look at the spectra of stars. And he found that stars have spectra in which you have a bright background and there are dark lines going across it. Uh, when he looked at some nebulae, he found that they did indeed have similar spectra, showing that they were made up from lots of individual stars. However, some nebulae had a quite different spectrum, in which you had a black background with bright lines superimposed upon it. And we only know of one type of material that can produce that sort of spectrum, and that is a hot, thin gas. So in this one observation, with a small telescope, Huggins is only using an 8-inch telescope, um, he was able to do better than uh, Lord Ross with his 72-inch uh, telescope and show that some of these nebulae, at least, were not stars, but were thin, hot gases. And the gas certainly is thin. It is indeed. Um, it would take uh, the entire volume of the Earth compressed down to the size of the studio um, to give the amount of air in this studio if you were to take it out from <laughs> the nebula. What kind of temperatures are we talking about in the gases of these nebulae? Oh, they're very hot, uh, typically 10,000 degrees, and that compares with only about 6,000 degrees at the surface of the sun. Um, but that's a bit misleading. Uh, if you were to get in a spacecraft and try to uh, journey to the sun, you would melt down long before you got there. Um, however, providing you had the heating on in your spacecraft, you could quite comfortably travel through the middle of one of these nebulae. The high temperature is offset by the very low density, and the total amount of energy involved is actually quite small. Um, the two types of nebulae, the planetary nebulae and the H2 regions, the gaseous nebulae, differ in two respects. Um, firstly, in terms of their masses, the planetary nebulae are quite small, um, a fraction of a solar mass to maybe one or two solar masses at most. The H2 regions are much, much larger, 100 to 10,000 or more times the mass of the Sun. Um, more fundamentally, however, they differ in the way in which they uh, are formed. The H2 regions are stellar creches, the planetary nebulae are stellar nursing homes. In other words, H2 regions are where stars are currently being born. Planetary nebulae occur at the end of a star's life. So planetary nebulae are different from any other classes of objects. In their way, they're unique. They are indeed. Um, they're formed from the material coming from the central star. And that central star is usually old. And because it's old, the stars are form found throughout the whole of the galaxy. So we find the nebulae throughout the whole of the galaxy. Um, the planetary nebulae are usually quite symmetrical, uh, not necessarily always circular. Here we can see a nice example, um, which looks as though it's on, on the end of a pin. <laughs> In fact, that's a satellite trail, which is one of the problems that is increasingly affecting many astronomical photographs. It is indeed, yes.
Um, the uh, H2 regions are often quite irregular, such as the Eagle Nebula that we have here, and of course the H2 regions are young. Now, one very important point here. We know that planetary nebulae are really old stars surrounded by huge shells of gas. Therefore, why do they show up in the sky as rings? Well, the shell develops from the star itself. The material comes out from the star and forms a spherical shell around it. Initially, that material is coming out at a relatively slow velocity, um, typically 50 kilometers per second or so. Uh, we have to remember, however, that that is only slow by interstellar standards. Terrestrially, it's very fast. Soon afterwards, a thousand years or so, a much faster outflow develops at about a thousand kilometers per second. And that sweeps out the interior and compresses the outer part of the nebula. The shell, therefore, is a thick shell. And if we were to look at it in cross-section, it would be something like this. An interior region which is vacant, uh, largely pure vacuum, um, and uh, the, the region of the shell itself. And when we look at it, we see it projected against the sky, so that in the centre, we're looking, in fact, through a smaller amount of material than at the edges, and therefore we see it projected against the sky as a ring. Not all planetary nebulae are symmetrical, though. Oh, no. The situation in reality, of course, is very much more complicated. And although many are roughly circular or symmetrical, some are quite complicated in shape. <laughs> and we have a nice example here, which is known as the Eskimo Nebula. <laughs> However, I think it looks a lot more like Adolf Hitler. It does, really, doesn't it? And uh, there's the recent example photographed by the Hubble Telescope, known as HEN 1357, um, which almost looks like a spiral galaxy, although, of course, it isn't. It is a, a gaseous nebula like all the rest. What about the composition of the planetaries? There again, we go back to Huggins, at least initially. Um, he was the first person to deduce the nature of stars. And he did this by looking at their spectra. And the spectrum of a star has these numerous dark lines in it. And he compared it with the spectra obtained from elements in the laboratory. And he found that uh, certain patterns of lines uh, repeated. And if a pattern of lines for a particular element um, could be identified in the uh, stellar spectrum, then you could be certain that that element was present in the star. When he tried to repeat this for the nebulae, um, he found that there were no coincidences. And um, eventually, he became so desperate uh, that he invented a new element, which, because the lines were appearing in the nebula, he called nebulium, uh, to try and explain the lines that he saw. Nowadays, that is um, ridiculous with our present knowledge of chemistry, but we have to remember this is back in 1864. And at that time, there were many holes in the periodic table, elements that hadn't been discovered. And indeed, it would only be five years later on that Norman Lockyer would become the first person to discover an element um, off the surface of the Earth when he found the lines of helium in the spectrum of the sun. Helios, the sun. That's right. And uh, so it wasn't so ridiculous at the time. However, as time went by, chemists found more and more elements, and the periodic table became filled up, and it was soon clear that nebulium couldn't exist. However, the problem remained, and it wasn't until the 1920s that Ira Bowen actually solved it. And he found that the lines were in fact due to oxygen, a normal element, but not in the normal state we have it in our atmosphere. It was oxygen which had lost two of its electrons, and the lines were what were called forbidden lines. In that case, how can we see them? Well, to a spectroscopist, forbidden means, in fact, very unlikely. And uh, in this case, the lines were about um, a millionth of the probability of occurring of the normal lines of oxygen. And it's only the very rarefied conditions of the nebulae that allowed the ions to accumulate in the state at which these lines could become visible. Once Bowen had given the clue, then the nature of the nebulae soon became sorted out, and in fact they turned out not to be very different from the sun. Mostly hydrogen, um, some helium, in fact a little bit richer in helium than the sun, and all the rest, um, the remaining elements.
and the nebulae are probably richer in helium because they've come from the central star and those stars have the end of their life and they've converted some of their hydrogen into helium. Yes, can we say a bit more about the central stars? They're rather unusual and rather interesting, aren't they? They are indeed. Um, they're amongst the hottest stars that uh, we can detect. Temperatures range from 50,000, which is hot enough, to an incredible 200,000 degrees. Um, we'd have to go well inside the sun to find temperatures that high. Um, the stars are also collapsing. They're on the way to forming white dwarfs. And uh, although they're small, uh, in many cases smaller than the sun, um, their high temperature means that they are emitting tens of times the amount of light that the sun emits. Much of that light is in the ultraviolet. And that ultraviolet light from the star enables us to see the nebula. And this is because the ultraviolet light ionizes the elements in the nebula, and those ions then recombine with electrons and emit the light, which we actually see coming from the nebula. Um, some of the stars are of relatively normal composition, but others lack the hydrogen, which is the commonest element in most stars, and are composed primarily of helium, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And what we are probably seeing in those cases is the core of um, a star. The nebula has stripped off the outer layers, and we're seeing the central core spinning extremely rapidly because it's um, collapsed and very rich in the products of hydrogen and helium burning. We know that our planetary nebula is really a star coming to near the end of its active life. But what happens next? Well, I'm afraid it's nothing terribly exciting. Um, the nebulae, like old soldiers, fade away. And they're quite short-lived by normal astronomical standards. And in about 100,000 years, they will continue their expansion and merge with the interstellar medium perhaps at some stage, uh, recondensing to form new stars and planets. Indeed, it's more than promise, probable that some of the material, which is actually in our own bodies, some of the atoms originated inside planetary nebulae formed early in the lifetime of the galaxy. What about our own sun? Is that likely to turn into a planetary nebula? Well, it might. Um, it's going to be 5,000 million years before that happens, if it does, and it's difficult to predict things that far in advance. However, the Sun does seem to come in on the bottom end of the size of stars that form planetary nebulae. Um, however, it's not likely to be something that will worry our descendants. They will have been extinguished long before that, in only 500 million years, uh, by the gradually increasing temperature of the Sun that will happen anyway. 500 million years. Well, at least it's not imminent. Chris, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. Meanwhile, they do have the planetary nebulae, and some of them are within range of small telescopes. Look in particular for M57, the ring nebula, directly between Beta and Gamma Lyrae. A small telescope will show it to you, and it really is a lovely sight. And it's rather sobering to reflect that in the far future, our sun may itself turn into a planetary nebula, although, as Chris had told us, we will not be there to see. Meanwhile, don't forget our information line. If you want the latest news, ring up a new number, please. 0891-800-330, 0891-800-330, and we'll give you the latest news. And when I come back next month, I'm going to talk about the outer solar system and these strange asteroidal bodies out beyond Neptune or Pluto that we believe come from the Kuiper Belt. So, until next month, good night.